am just overjoyed to welcome our first guest. Um, and I am not going to say the name properly because my Spanish sucks, but Irin Garzon, uh, welcome. Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. She is tuning in today from UK, but she's originally a Spanish midwife. Welcome, my friend. Uh, thank you very much, Agustin. Irene, that's how you pronounce my name in Irene. Spanish. Irene. Yeah. But I, I tend to answer to anything because I understand it's difficult. So anything I know more or less that sounds like my name, that's okay. That's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I'm delighted. I think I was thinking, oh, I, I don't want to talk now. I just want to listen to the others. It's just like, I hope my time goes really quickly so I can keep listening to all the speakers you've you've put together. So it's really, really nice. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm from Spain. I um, wanted to be a midwife since I was 12. I saw a cesarean section uh, then. Uh, <laughs> my dad was an obstetrician. It was a time when they put uh, women under general anesthetic and and she was already asleep when I went in. I'm not saying how good this was, but this is what happened. And then the midwife took the baby away and I was just like, wow, who is that? I want to do what that woman's doing. And so I started nursing because that's the only way you can become a midwife in Spain. You have to be a nurse first and then you specialize as a, as a midwife after. And after I was a nurse, I came to the UK to work as a nurse and uh, ended up studying midwifery here in the, in the UK. I loved it from beginning to end, but I could see that I was um, very different from the most of them. I could see that everyone, I mean, I, the UK is one of the countries where midwifery is stronger and we have got more uh, autonomy and more independence, but I, I could see it still, there wasn't that much uh, of it. So um, I could see that people in general are scared of birth and it, I, I remember once I was like a junior student and somebody rang the bell and I went to inside and it was a senior student. And she was, uh, the lady she was with, she was delivering, the head was crowning, she was standing up and she was so nervous because there was no midwife, not anyone there. And she said, do something, get someone. And I just went in and stayed by her side, just helping her and telling her, don't worry, it's okay, you've got this. Somebody will come, but if they don't, it's better that you're with someone else than on your own. And I trained in Birmingham, which is a very international place. So I learned so much from, from so many different cultures, but I learned overall about um, respect and making your voice be heard. People listened to what I had to say. So then after a while, after working in the UK, I went back to Spain and that was just, well, not a shock because that's my country and I knew how things were, but um, it is, it's the way as um, um, you were saying that women are very uh, Midwives are like under the doctor's um, rules. They are the ones who say what needs doing and the midwives are like nurses that work for them. So I, the law in Spain, I mean, we are defined as autonomous practitioners. However, uh, the vast majority of midwives do have a really hard time when they actually want to practice uh, autonomously. Uh, because it's been like this, and I'm sure that in many countries it's very similar, it's been like this for, for a long time. It's been the doctor is the boss and he's the one who saves 
women or she uh, he's uh, it seems that there is I mean I don't know about you but whenever I've traveled and I talk about midwifery there's a very common question that is but you mean there's no doctor there and it's like exactly there's no doctor there I'm I'm the expert of of normality I'm the expert of physiology uh, but that's really difficult to understand I guess obviously once you have the power it's very difficult to to give it away and so when I went back to Spain every day was a battle because obviously I, I just couldn't understand how everything was so um, standardized it was like a conveyor belt for birth is this what women said or ask for it was just no no we don't do that here no you like you just have to comply with what we've got and home birth was not uh well i was going to say not legal it was there was so so many little home births that they didn't really um take a lot of care about this and when I worked there for a, what three years in two different hospitals, one was a huge university hospital, and then I went to another one that was a small unit where things were much easier. And well, then when I met my husband and I moved to another place, I knew that was it. I was not going to be able to work in a hospital, in Spanish hospital again. And that's when I went independently. I was an independent midwife for about six years. Um, women uh, in Spain have to pay for a midwife if they want to have a home birth. And that they don't have to pay if they have the baby at the hospital. Uh, those have been the best years of my uh, life of my professional life because I I said yes to everyone and meaning usually women who wanted to have a home birth it was because either they had had a horrible experience before or because um, what they wanted couldn't happen like they had had a previous cesarean section and they were telling them another section it was the option or a breech baby or anything that it was just like no you come to the hospital and we do what we want you don't have a say on this so while I was an independent midwife I accompanied a lot of women who were over 42 weeks uh, a breech delivery uh, women who had had no antenatal care because they chose to do it this way obviously they had looked after themselves but they and they were say them uh, women who had previous cesarean sections and then I gave birth I have two daughters I gave birth to them without any assistance and that was just wonderful after that we went to Bangladesh and we were traveling and we well, I got a job in Bangladesh to help them develop the midwifery career. And I learned so much from them. And I still have a lot of contact with these uh, Bangladeshi midwives just to help them um, get into global midwifery and to understand that it's not just what happens in their country, but how there is this huge network of midwives how we can support each other how we can be together um, and after Bangladesh I was there one and a half years I came back to the to the UK I started working in a hospital because I had to I had been 11 years outside of the UK and it was just if you want a job this is what you have to do and it was in labor ward which for me was just like after being an independent midwife, after being in Bangladesh, just going back to labor ward where everything again is very standardized and these are the protocols and this is how we do things. It was, it was a little bit hard, but then I moved into a birth center and then I went to university. I've been teaching for the last three years. At the moment, I'm only working part-time there and I'm developing uh, training for midwives worldwide but uh, trying that the midwives in the developed countries 
who have more access and more resources uh, help like in a symbiotic way to pay for the training of the midwives in developing countries and and it's it's uh I think it's necessary. It's like uh, some of you, not all of you, but now on Facebook that uh, people are being very active. And I, I ask questions like, what do you, would you say to a woman who is over 42 weeks? And it is mainly for these, for these midwives who don't have that much um, contact with the outside world to, oh, see what the others are answering, see what, how midwifery is connecting all of us together. Um, I think it's really important, this is something I always tell my students and I tell everyone, uh, midwives are the experts in normality, in physiological birth. And don't forget that, no matter who you are discussing this with. Because usually we become very little when an authority, someone who, even if we are working uh, independently and then we have to transfer a woman to the hospital because of whatever the reason, we tend to feel very, very little and, and we're afraid of the other person having more power, more authority. And as I said, we are the experts, not others. The, what I usually say is like we, uh, women are the only people who go to a doctor when nothing is, is wrong with them. And if you are with a friend and they said, oh, I'm going to the dermatologist or I'm going to the ophthalmologist, the question will be, oh, what's happening? Are you okay? Is there a problem? But we have got this very clear, I'm going to the gynecologist. Oh, that's normal. That's something that you do. And it's no, it's not normal because doctors, like I mean medical doctors, should be there for when things are not happening, are not going well. When there is something going wrong, where is, there is a pathology, that's when doctors should come in. And usually when we talk about uh, normal birth, uh, you see that the people tell, tend to say, whenever you are arguing something, it's like, we've got the knowledge. We are the ones who know how to hold um, that space. We are the ones who know how to, what we need to provide uh, women for them to have a safe birth. But however, we get to hear this as, I'm the doctor. I'm the one who, like, I'm the doctor, like, yes, I know, and that's why you shouldn't be here, let's say. So I think we need to speak up. And I think we need to, um, when I was working in the hospitals, it was really, really hard. And I can see what Leila was saying, that uh, they have very little training and they, have, uh, they are silent and they have no voice. Uh, it was the same with me, but you know, what drives you. You know you look after women and you are on the side of the woman, not on the side of the hospital, of the health provider. You are on the side on her side and that's what you have to think. So whenever somebody tries to tell you to do something wrong, let's say, is your moment to say like, no, because you know that's not the right thing. And obviously it will be difficult at the beginning and then you will be the one who, oh, that we have to be careful with her. But you know you're right. I remember once um, I left the hospital where I was working first in Spain when uh, like all the doctors came into the room, one after another, I think it was like eight of them. and. Of course, the poor woman was scared what was happening. And I said, with you and your baby, nothing. This is for me. And that was it because I, I usually stood up in front of them and said, no, this is. So they decided to come just the whole team. So I would, they would silence me. That was my last day. I handed in my resignation after that because, because that couldn't be. But you have to stay strong. You have to say, okay, this is 
if you know what you're doing is good, then go ahead and do it. Because when you go back home, if you haven't done it, you're going to feel much worse that you should have helped that woman and you didn't, that you shouldn't have done, I don't know, that episiotomy that the doctor urged you to do and you did it. You, yes, in that moment, you're going to be quite scared and quite frightened that you're telling someone, hey, I'm, I'm doing this or I'm, I'm in charge of what is happening here. But I think it's really, really important that we speak up. For me, the times that I felt worse have been the times when I didn't, when I just put my head down and did as I was ordered. Obviously, I mean, I can see there's a lot of experience here. The more experienced you are, the more um, you are going to be able to do something like this. And if you arrive working in a place, the first thing you're not going to do is just like <laughs> everybody to hate you and not like you because you're the one who causes trouble. But you have to have things very, very clear. There was, um, when I was here in the UK this last time, about three years ago, there was the, um, a woman who wanted to uh, have a breech delivery. It was her fourth baby and when they asked me if I could uh, go and look after her. I'm specialized in vaginal breach. And yeah, I, I went there to look after her. And when I arrived there, already two doctors had gone in, tried to convince her to have a cesarean section. And there was a third doctor now trying to convince to try and turn the baby to see. And the woman had already said no several times. And he was like, what are you trying to do? I, I mean, are you just going to carry on until she finally says, agrees to what you want? So in that moment, I closed the door. I told them, keep away. I looked after this woman. And when she started to push, I helped her into all fours and then I rang the bell because the rest of the people had to come here. So when the doctors came, it was very scary, let's say, because obviously they were saying, oh, I'm not comfortable like this. This woman is not in a position that I feel comfortable with. And I kept saying, I am doing this. I am. I know what I'm doing. Just whenever they try to touch something, it's hands off. You don't touch this. Then when the baby was uh, starting to um, come out, uh, there was something that I needed to do. I needed to turn the baby because the baby was just uh, not facing the, the right way. And the doctor kept asking me, uh, can I take over? I, how long are you going to stay? And I, I mean, finally, I just stayed uh, strong. The baby was born and everybody was happy. Everybody left. Like two minutes after I, I left the woman with another midwife and I went there and lie on the floor just like ah, this. But it is extremely important to, you know you're doing it right. And that's what we need to do. We need to fight for these women. We need to help them uh, achieve what they want. And as I said, we are the specialists. I mean, if you are going to have a, um, uh, I don't know, if you want to ha have a house, you would go to an um, architect. And if you want to build something, you would go to an engineer. So if you want to have a baby, and if you, you go to a midwife, it's like nobody goes to a doctor when they're healthy. And this is how we have to make um, our voice valid and our voice heard. I want to read you a story that is, uh, just tell me if, I mean, I'm just going to uh, change the screen and uh, just let me know if can you still see me or hear me. I guess so. But uh, yes, you, you can just do with your head and I'm happy to yeah, okay, so you can hear me and see me. So this story, it's uh, by an Argentinian author that is called Jorge Bucay. And, and it's, uh, it's called The Tale of the Butterfly. Um, my mom was the daughter of a peasant couple from Entre Rios. She was born and raised in the field among animals, birds, and flowers. 
She told us that one morning, as she was walking through the forest picking up fallen branches to light the furnace fire, she saw a warm cocoon hanging from a broken stem. She thought it would be safer for the poor larva to take him home and adopt him in, his care, in her care. When she arrived, she put it under a lamp so that it gave heat and put it close to a window so that the air was not lacking. During the following hours, my mother stayed by her protege, waiting for the great moment. After a long wait, which did not end until the next morning, the young girl saw the cocoon tear and a small hairy leg appear from within. Everything was magical, and my mom told us that she had the feeling of witnessing a miracle. But suddenly, the miracle seemed to become a tragedy. The little butterfly seemed not to have enough force to break the tissue of its capsule, no matter how hard he tried. He couldn't get out through the small hole in his ephemeral house. My mother could not stay without doing anything. She ran to the top room and returned with a pair of delicate tweezers and a long, thin, sharp scissor that my grandmother used in embroidery. Taking great care not to touch the insect, she cut a window in the cocoon to allow the butterfly to emerge from its confinement. After a few minutes of anguish, the poor butterfly had managed to leave his prison behind and stumbled towards the light from the window. My mother tells that, full of emotion, she opened the window to say goodbye to the new arrival on his first flight. However, the butterfly fly did not fly away, even when the tip of the tweezers gently brushed against it. She thought he was scared by her presence and left him by the open window, certain that she would not find him when she returned. After playing all afternoon, my mom returned to her room and found by the window her motionless butterfly, the wings stuck to his body, the stiff legs towards the ceiling. My mother always told us how anxious she was to take the insect to her father, to tell him everything that had happened and to ask him what else he should have done to help him better. My grandfather, who seemed to be one of those almost illiteral, illiterate sages who walked the world, stroked her head and told her that there was nothing else she should have done. Then in reality, the good help would have been to do less and not more. Butterflies need that terrible effort that breaking their prison means to live. Because in those moments, explained my grandfather, her heart beats with great force and the pressure that is generated in its primitive circulatory trees injects the blood into the wings. Ah, I've lost it. Okay. <laughs> um, which does expand and enable it to fly. The butterfly that was helped out of its shell was never able to spread its wings because my man had not let him fight for his life. My mother always told us that many times she would have liked to ease our way, but she remembered her butterfly and preferred to let us inject our wings with the strength of our own heart. So as I'm sure you can understand why I've chosen this, this story to, to share with you, because that's it. We midwives are the grandfather, are the one who, we, we don't save people from anywhere. We just wait and let them do what nature is intended. We support them, we help them, but we don't do things for them. We don't save them. We don't think we are more than they and without our intervention, that's not going to happen. And I think there is, birth is so medicalized now that um, there's many of us who are like the mother of the author who just try and save women and babies from what is happening. It's quite patronizing doing things this way, just believing that women are not going to be able to do this, these things if we, if we don't help them. 
and I will, I don't know if I can share these, these stories, so they will, I don't know, Agustin, will there be like a, a folder or something where we can add things or is it just going to be? Yes, if you send me the link, okay. I will include it in the show notes. Okay. The link to where okay. we could read this online, not the whole poem, but where it is. Okay, I don't know because it was translated, but I'll I'll see I'll see I'll see if I we'll can. Message. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Very good. And another thing I wanted to tell you when I first started working at the university, I was uh, I I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's. I'm just the midwife uh, with a lot of experience. But like my studies, I've just got. Uh, uh, degree in midwifery and when I started working at the university I um, joined this course with a lot of people from all, all, also the lecturers uh, to learn how to teach let's say so with it was full of professors and people with uh, doctorates and uh, and after four or five days together we were going to have lunch together and I was so happy to, to be able to share time with them and as I said to you there's like I really want this to my time to go so I can listen to the others obviously you learn much more by listening than when you talk you don't learn anything but when you listen so I was so excited to to listen to to these people and to pick the brains and see so we sat and one of them asked me, I had something about women, listen to women, and uh, somebody asked me, what, what, what does that mean? What do you, and I started talking about midwifery, why we should listen to women, and then I didn't have lunch. It was one question after another. They kept asking me questions. They were completely amazed by birth by what happens I was talking to them about hormones about what happens in the mother and the baby's brain when they're born and I this was so uh, enlightening for me when I was actually looking forward to this meeting these people and they just I, I didn't hear anyone talking I, I really wanted to it was just they kept asking questions and more questions and more questions. And I think that's one of the things that we should never forget. As midwives, we do have so much knowledge and this knowledge is so fantastic that we, we should share it with, with everyone. And I think this is me. I don't know if we answer any questions or if people have. It's so great. You are such a dream. Everyone is just shouting your praises. Um, Hi, we've heard thank you. Lots, lots of what um, uh, Shereem um, has said, you are my shero. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. uh, Morgan has said, good job. Very good webinar and awesome and incredible and so beautiful and wow. And thank you. And wow. that was just lovely. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're so, so honored to have you in this circle and, and to, um, you know, just hear your wisdom. What you're creating in the world is just exceptional. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I was so looking forward to meeting uh, all of you and to be here like last night. Well, finally, it's tomorrow. So I'm really, yeah. really happy. And I'm really looking forward, as I said, to hang up, switch off my microphone and keep listening to you. Thank you, Augustine. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Leila, for this amazing uh, webinar that you've put together. I'm really, really happy. Thank you for starting us off on such a beautiful note. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation. It was so much helping for other midwives to feel more passion about what they are feeling and they get more um, uh, heart touching with your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you too.